Hello, I am Kathy Giacomini, co-principal investigator of the UCSF Stanford Searcy, and it is my pleasure to welcome everyone here today and to introduce Atul Butte as our Searcy lecture. Atul will talk to us about something near and dear to our hearts, practicing medicine for the COVID pandemic from a trillion points of data. Atul is the Priscilla, Priscilla Chan and Mark Zuckerberg Distinguished Professor at UCSF, he is also the inaugural director of the Baker Computational Health Sciences Institute and the chief data scientist for the entire University of California health system. Atul has been continually funded by NIH for 20 years. He's an inventor on 24 patents and he has co-authored over 200 publications. His research is repeatedly featured in prominent news media such as the New York Times. Atul is an elected member of the National Academy of Medicine, and I'm very much looking forward to his talk today, as I am sure all of you are as well. Atul, please begin. Great, thanks for having me. It's great to talk to uh, colleagues at the FDA. Uh, I've been uh, on many calls and Zooms with many of you over the past year, obviously, um, evidence accelerators and all the rest. Uh, and if I'm not on those calls, many of my team members are too. Um, uh, so we appreciate uh, the, the close collaboration and uh, certainly significant amount of funding uh, through the Cersei program uh, going into this kind of work here. Now, I'm just gonna get right into this. Uh, there's a lot going on obviously with vaccines and that's another whole story which we can talk about in the Q&A. Uh, and please submit your questions and answers through the uh, Q&A uh, feature of Zoom. I have it, uh, have it open here so I can uh, maybe address some questions as I'm going and I'll address uh, the rest uh, towards the end. Uh, all right, just a quick introduction to the University of California. Uh, uh, who are we? So we have, we're enormous, right? 10 campuses, three national labs. I think Lawrence Livermore has the number one supercomputer in the country, 200,000 employees. So we're one of the larger employers in the United States, quarter million students per year. And now of course we have six medical schools and 14 other health professional schools. So nursing, pharmacy, dental, veterinary and public health schools. Uh, we train half the medical students and residents in California, $2 billion in NIH funding, $13 billion a year seeing patients. 5,000 doctors get a paycheck from us every month, but 100,000 doctors write orders on our patients. And we're not just random centers, UCSF and UCLA are in the US News Top 10, but of course we only mention that when we're in the Top 10, otherwise we don't care so much for that metric. We have five uh, in independent and but functioning together, so five NCI comprehensive cancer centers, and five clinical translational science awards. And then we got these secret superpowers, which are so secret, we even forget we have them. Uh, two are mentioned at the bottom there, IRB reliance, which means essentially, if one of the medical schools approves an IRB, the others more or less automatically approve it in days to weeks instead of weeks to months. And then we have centralized contracting. So if a contract is signed by the office of the president at the University of California, all 10 campuses agree to the terms more or less without any renegotiation. So we can execute our clinical trials if signed off at OP incredibly quickly and, and all the rest. And of course, what we have now uh, been running now for the past three years uh, uh, is a central data warehouse with all the clinical data across all these to fulfill this umbrella that we call uh, University of California Health or UC Health. Uh, of course, I'm an IT guy, so I know how to make boxes point to boxes on PowerPoint. So here's the one slide that looks like that. You can see, see the six uh, academic medical centers at the bottom. Now, Riverside is brand new, okay? They're just a new medical school. They don't have a hospital system there yet. Uh, they have some clinics, but the other five are enormous, okay? Right, like I said, comprehensive cancer center status and beyond, millions of patients in each. And uh, what we were happy with uh, was all of their clinical data flowing centrally. So they keep a copy of course, but it also flows centrally, it's harmonized every month. But of course with COVID now, all COVID data moves every day. Uh, so we still got a monthly feed, but then we got a lot of daily feeds for COVID related data. Uh, and I'll explain exactly what this means on the next slide here. This is centralized, okay? So of course we all know about federated systems, uh, but we have a centralized system here. This is a busy slide, so I'll step through it because I think you're a little bit more uh, wanting to know about the data, especially for real world evidence. Uh, here you can see uh, uh, at the top, the top line number we like the, the most that we start with is uh, the combined data, 15 million patients that we've seen over the past 15 years. We love that number because it's nice and round. It's about 5% of the US population, but that actually predates us really putting in EPIC, which is our electronic health record system. Uh, that was, that's right around January of 2012. 
Uh, and if you look from then forward, it's about six to seven million patients. Now, of course, this is changing every single day, but we're just shy of seven million patients with what we'd say is modern data from the electronic health record. That's about 200 million encounters, a quarter, a half billion procedures, my favorite, three quarters of a billion medication orders or prescriptions, 680 million diagnosis codes, and two billion blood tests or vi and vital sign measurements. Uh, or as I like to say, we have everything from Tylenol to CAR T cells. Tylenol is probably the cheapest thing we can do to a patient to give a pill of Tylenol, fraction of a penny, to CAR T cells where we have, and obviously have been uh, uh, involved with the trials and now deploy CAR T cells, probably the most expensive thing we can do to a patient. Um, we also have integrated with all this uh, OSHPA data, which is our state regulatory data. So things on like the stay and location of hospitals and other hospital systems in the state, pathology and radiology text elements. So we, were, we have a plan to actually get all text data into this central data warehouse. And conveniently, we also run the death index for the state of California. So anyone who dies, not just our patients, we eventually know about by running the death index. We also run, we also have integrated with this uh, claims data from our self-funded plans. Now, I'm not gonna go into too much detail there, but as we are a large employer, uh, many of our own employees get medical care from us, right? They work for us, but they also get medical care at our medical systems, right? So in that case, we have the EHR data, but we also have the claims data, right? That's that's important uh, uh, point to make. And then we're incentivized to make sure that care is the best and also most cost-effective. We're constantly harmonizing all of these elements. Harmonizing means really like, you know, as you know, the FDA, new drugs, new biologics come out, let's say every day, every week, every month, and we gotta make sure we're all using the same codes. Even before they're in RX norm, we have to call it something, right? So we've gotta make sure all these interim codes work. And also to be clear, we don't have one instance of Epic. I think we're up to eight instances of Epic across this whole set here. Um, and we weren't even all on Epic. Uh, Irvine was the last to move on Epic. I think it's been two and a half years. And then this all gets funded internally because of the quality and performance dashboards we do, which add enough value to the health system that essentially that pays for that covers most of this bill here to run this. Uh, all right, so this is just a screenshot from just earlier this morning. Here are the roughly 6 million patients that are alive and live in this part of the country. And you could just see here, uh, this as of January, 2021, uh, UCSF, UC Davis in the Northern part of California, uh, LA, uh, Irvine and San Diego in the Southern part of California. There is a tiny little red dot there somewhere for Riverside, which you can barely see. But you can also see um, uh, Las Vegas as patients, right? The Hawaiian islands are covered with our patients. So they're not just in California, of course. Right? If you're sick, you're gonna come to UC, this part of, the, uh, part of the country. Of course, we can do race, age, gender, ethnicity. Uh, we also have the area deprivation index. We map all of our uh, street addresses to a nine digits of code. From there, get a FIPS code. And from there, get a ADI measurement. So we can see as just one of many social determinants of health we can capture on our patients. So you can just see the bar graph of ADI. Of course, many of our patients are on the coast and the coast tends to be a little bit more wealthier uh, in terms of uh, uh, socioeconomic status in California. So we do see many of our patients from one and two, but we also see many from seven, eight, nine, and 10, including many homeless, which we would put in area 10. We also have many primary care patients to shy of 700,000, but most of our patients are also tertiary and quaternary care. So you can see that on the bottom right here. This is all done automatically now uh, uh, with our dashboards. We also capture telehealth encounters. Now, I'm not gonna go into detail for you guys on this, but boy, telehealth is incredible. This is a week to week plot uh, starting for January, 2019. And you can see in 2019 and early 2020, of course, telehealth was essentially nothing. There's a tiny sliver of orange there. And then you can see what has happened, of course, during COVID and has not let up, okay? So you can see 30 to 40 to 50,000 telehealth encounters completed every week ongoing right now. All of these are documented in Epic as well. Uh, just imagine for, for an instance, machine learning on more than a million successfully completed telehealth encounters. That's what we have in this database. I think we're up to 1.2 million telehealth encounters documented in Epic right now. So of course we're going crazy with this. Race, age, ethnicity, age, who's, who's tolerated more than one of these? Who wants more of these, right? Uh, and all of that. Uh, so that could probably be an hour long talk on just this one slide that we, we're just starting to explore. Of course, COVID, okay, now let's switch gears to COVID. 
Now, uh, like I said, we were happy on a monthly data feed and now we switched to daily data feeds for COVID. And many of you get this email. I think some of your senior leadership at FDA gets this. So does the CDC, the White House, uh, many others. And here is this morning's email uh, so that some of you might have received. So we generate this graphic. Uh, so what happens is every night at midnight, uh, the clarity run uh, starts running uh, from each of the epic instances. And that runs from midnight to six in the morning. So all of the relational tables are built on each of the campuses. Then from six to about eight in the morning, all that data is dumped out and then uh, converted, uh, then transferred to us, and then we stitch it together. On the right there, for example, you see more than 50 ways to order a COVID PCR test in the University of California. So we have to go through all of these, make sure we know what's a positive, what's a negative, what's indeterminate. And so we've done that and we see new ones all the time. For example, you see many joint tests with COVID and influenza. Of course, we have to separate the COVID part of that test and we'll deal with the influenza part of that test later, right? But we're talking COVID tests here. And then on the left there, you can see that we run, obviously we see fewer people on weekends still, so that's in the 3000 range, but sometimes we'll see up to 8,000 uh, patients for COVID testing. The vast majority are UC San Diego because they particularly register everyone they see as a patient at, in UC SD Health, uh, including all of their students and ser uh, serial uh, ser zero surveillance. Now, people have questions. I have some amazing graphs on just tests and test performance, uh, and I'll get to those. And someone's already asked, are these tests only conducted within the hospital system? It, of course, includes all of our clinics. It doesn't include, we don't run LTCFs. So, um, uh, but if a sample came to us from a long-term care facility, it would be included here. Now, to also be clear, we also are subcontractees. We run thousands of tests a day for other people's patients like Kaiser and Sutter and Dignity, San Francisco General Hospital. I'm not even counting them here, okay? These are just the ones that are in our electronic health record. So we know a lot about what they were before and what they are after this test, okay? Of course, we run more tests than this, but I'm not even counting those here. All right, let me keep going. So this is just the number of tests, right? Uh, let's see here. Okay, these are the positives and negatives. So this, as of this morning, our current run rate, if I move the Q&A window here, our rolling seven-day rate is now down, finally down to 1.85%. You can see in San Diego, uh, it's way less than 1%, actually. It's a third of a percent, which is interesting. They're lower than San Francisco, I just noticed. Uh, but uh, the worst is still in Orange County, I think Irvine at 3%. You can see how high we were. Uh, uh, in uh, the middle of December, we had blown past a 40% positive rate, uh, and now we're much lower here. The question immediately came up, do we collect genomic data? On a research sense, we do. It's not in our EHR data uh, set, uh, set up yet. And worst off, I'm gonna question you guys, is there any CLIA CAP approved or even EAA, EAA, EAA emergency use authorization test approved for sequencing? I'm not really sure, but to our, my knowledge, we don't have CLIA CAP COVID sequencing yet. So we're not putting in the EHR yet. We, we have the research side of it, uh, but we're way behind on that, okay? Remember, we have Chan Zuckerberg, we have a whole bunch of uh, our affiliated research groups sequencing, but it's not in our EHR yet. And we should think about that and where we need to go with that. Obviously, we're, we're trying to figure out which one of our labs can stand up clear cap sequencing first for COVID. But to my knowledge, we don't have any of that yet. Then you can see the age of the positives, the uh, uh, age sex breakdown, the last seven days of zip codes. They're finally all in California. Now, believe me, during the winter, uh, the, the, during the holidays, we saw many positives from elsewhere in the country, obviously traveling here for a vacation or visiting family, and then we would notice a whole bunch of them. So now it's, we're just down to California people being positive in a California health system here, okay? And then we have the inpatients, okay? And then the punchline there in the, in the text there. But the inpatients, you can see on the top left, uh, we went up to, uh, we blew past 800 simultaneous admissions. Uh, we're down to 212. So even though everything is you know, seemingly better, please do recognize we're still quite high, okay? Of course it's coming down, but we're still as high as where we were in, uh, let's say September last year, right? The lowest we had gotten to was 80 simultaneous admissions. So 212 admissions, you can see the inpatient census on the top right there. You can see how many are in the intensive care units compared to capacity, how many are on ventilators, how many are on ECMO. I think our peak we hit was 23 people on ECMO. I think here we're down to, if I add this quickly, 16 on ECMO. 
you can see we sent home 5,300 successfully. 1,000 others uh, went home to other situations. 769 went to uh, inpatient rehab. They're probably still on their way home. Uh, and then 715 have passed away. So the punchline you can see at the top left there in, in the red and black text, over half a million tested, 36,000 positives. So that's about 7% of those tested overall since the beginning of the pandemic. 7,800 admitted. So that's still about 20% of our positives were admitted. And then 715 expired, which is 10%, uh, 9% of those admitted or 2% of our positives as a crude case fatality rate here. Uh, quick questions here. Impressive data. Uh, do we see correlation of positive tests and diagnosis? Oh, I'm going to get to the diagnoses in a minute. Uh, uh, can we distinguish uh, those enrolled in an NIH or other agency funded trial for study? Yes, we can. Okay, so we were one of the first to sign up for Remdesivir, right? Now it gets puzzling for trials, right? Because as sophisticated as a trial is, you still have to order the drug in Epic, right? So it shows up for us as an investigational drug. We see the trial number, but we can't actually tell if they got placebo or drug. Now that's actually kind of interesting. I think when trials are unblinded, we should figure out a mechanism to go back and put into Epic or your EHR choice, which drug did they get? There is no mechanism for that right now, but we should think about that, talk about that because we're gonna to wanna to record in an EHR which drug they got, placebo or not. We have no mechanism. As far as I can tell, there is no mechanism nationwide after the unblinding of study to go back and tell which patient uh, drug had. But we can tell they were part of a trial and they were on the order of hundreds of patients. Um, of course, we do our own studies too, you know, data-driven ones and things like that. But we could tell at least for investigational drugs. In fact, it's not just COVID, any investigational drug, we could tell if our patient got the drug, got, got the, Got, was on the study, let's put it that way. All right, let me keep going here. Uh, all right, so, okay. So now out, out of all of that, we synthesize something called CORDS. So the University of California COVID research data set. Now CORDS is always a little bit behind. It can be a couple of weeks behind, maybe sometimes, sometimes a couple of days, sometimes a couple of weeks behind. So these are uh, slides uh, created by Rohit Vaishis, who is superstar. Uh, I think he's been on many evidence accelerator calls. He's representing us in the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation uh, uh, projects. So he's been there from the beginning doing all this work. So I'm using his slides here. And you can see here the number of COVID negatives, positives, uh, uh, sex, uh, ethnicity, age breakdown. I'm gonna go through these in a moment here, what the differences are here. By the way, the expired count here is different than the expired count here. Right away, you see a difference, right? And so you have to ask yourself, what does it mean to die of COVID? Okay, Does it, so if a patient dies in the hospital in, on a ventilator, obviously, uh, and they're COVID positive recently, that's an obvious COVID death. What if they've been in the hospital already for 30 days, and now all of a sudden someone says they're no longer COVID positive? Is that still a COVID death? Not exactly clear. What if they get discharged and then somehow die? Maybe they have some other pre-existing condition. Is that a COVID death or not? So there are all sorts of ways to count COVID deaths, okay? Now, I, I'm just telling you like it is. Uh, if it happens in-house or in our clinic, we can know that for sure. Um, but if they die after, then that's a larger number. And so that's the larger number you see here. Uh, okay, these are the five main campuses. And you can see the two peaks, uh, actually three peaks uh, of uh, admissions. Uh, and uh, we are uh, able to look at deaths and uh, mortality rate and hospitalization rates. And of course they're different, right? We saw more admissions at certain campuses than others. Uh, but, uh, so the age of patients tested positive and those who need a hospitalization significantly vary across UC Health. These are not equal populations. The Orange County population is very different than the Davis population, okay? And you can see the age breakdowns here, but there is no significant difference in mortality by uh, across UC Health, so that's good. Um, at least by an ANOVA test here. We look at all of these plots constantly. Race, ethnicity, and sex distributions for those tested, positive, admitted, and died of COVID. And so here you can see, uh, and this mirrors what has already been published by many others. Blacks had significantly higher odds of a positive COVID diagnosis. Asians had a significantly lower positive, at least in our population. Uh, Hispanic or Latinx population has significantly higher odds of a positive test and women had lower odds, men had a higher odds uh, of having a positive test. Then if you look at hospitalization, right? Because you gotta look at these separately here, 
Blacks had a significant higher odds of hospitalization as did Asians if they were positive, uh, as did uh, Hispanic Latinx, as did men. And then if you look at who died of COVID, uh, Asians actually had a higher uh, odds of mortality, uh, but uh, our numbers for Black, Hispanic, and Latinos were too small for us to draw. Uh, again, our total number is between 700 and 800 here. So we're, we're not gonna say one way or the other. Here. We're trends, but we can't say but uh, confidence or significance. But these, for uh, men and Asians, we could say had higher odds. Prevalence of pre-existing conditions. I think this was one of the questions. Now, Rohit loves to show it this way. You can show it in tables, so it pick up three different slides. And you can just see uh, pre-existing conditions overrepresented testing positive, testing positive and being admitted, testing positive, being admitted and dying. And you can just see uh, quickly with your eye, uh, dermatomyositis is up there. That's kind of interesting. Obviously you need uh, particular immunosuppressants for some of these conditions. Inborn errors of metabolism, hypertension, people know about diabetes, mellitus, kidney disease is definitely high uh, up there, peripheral vascular disease. So all of these uh, go into positive and some protective uh, ones as well. Now, NIH treatment. So NIH has had consensus di uh, guidance of all the drugs under constant evaluation. Uh, this is a copy paste from the NIH guidelines. This constantly is changing. Uh, at last look, 94 different drugs in 17 different categories. And so what we can do is just to see how many of these are in use in any of our patients, in patients. And we've generated what we call these calendar plots. Now I know uh, Amy Bernathy and many others have been asking us for these calendar plots all year. You haven't asked for these in a while, but after you guys EUA something, how does it actually uh, impact the utilization? And so you can see here, here's daily orders of remdesivir across UC Health. Every day is literally how many orders were placed for remdesivir. Uh, and you can see, obviously December, January, a lot of people using remdesivir, but it was also in November there too, and maybe a little bit of a blue in July and certainly continuing into February. But other than that, uh, the max you had were 150 orders per day here uh, across our system here. 2,500 unique patients getting an order for remdesivir. So easy for us now to say yes or no, you know, do those kinds of studies. Of course, you'd have to control for a lot of other things to make sure your propensity matching folks. ACE inhibitors match the same kind of pattern here, about a thousand patients getting an ACE inhibitor. And steroids, of course, corticosteroids, you can see similar pattern, but not exactly the same pattern. More folks in July uh, getting it as well as in August, but a fewer in September, October. Uh, remember the press on corticosteroids, I think was around July and August. So we saw a little bit of an uptake there. Uh, all right, so then taking all of those treatment patterns into account, we can just start to plot what we call these radial plots. Uh, each of these, you, so what you're looking at here is each of those categories is given a color here. And then we can start to see, well, which of these were given in which order, right? Did a patient get something first? And then as they got worse, they got something else. And so we can see 185 different treatments were used uh, and about 1200, 1195 unique utilization pathways. Meaning this was used first, then they tried this, then they tried that. Low molecular weight heparin is the biggest one, right? Obviously, we already were using that pre-COVID. So you can see it's not the same dose, and dosing is going to be important here. Uh, and to be really clear, you, don't, you can't get the dosing and claims data. So uh, just because someone's on low molecular weight heparin, it could be just autopilot for us. It might not be because of COVID. But so molecular weight heparin is a big one, obviously. And then corticosteroids uh, is, uh, would be the second most ordered. In other words, used second in, in a lot of people's care. So this is all there for research. We can go crazy looking at these patterns with you guys if you guys have questions on this. And we've gotten some papers out on this. So uh, some of these we've already presented at Evidence Accelerator. Um, here's, uh, here's my favorite because I'm the CEO author on this one. Rohit did this work where we were already seeing so many patients getting uh, serology tests ordered. And serology, I mean, uh, so antibodies, like, so IgG against COVID, not against, not to show the vaccine. So all pre-vaccine. So many people getting serology testing that we said, well, why don't we just use this to evaluate the performance of serology? Because we have so many of these folks getting serology tested when we already had a positive PCR test on them. So that's what you're seeing here. So on the left here, the top left, so this was published in JAMA Network Open. I think it came out just maybe three weeks ago, maybe a little bit longer. Uh, uh, 2021, okay, so probably it was in January. On the top left, the A panel there, you can see uh, how many patients got a COVID a serology test after a PCR test was positive. And 
of course, not all of them were positive. So 121, 121 of them were negative. So just to be clear, we know they had PCR positive, but they're negative for serology. And you can see most of the negatives were too early. So if you're ordering a serology test before 14 days, your odds are, that, are still gonna be that it's negative. Uh, that's a no brainer. That's kind of basic immunology, but of course people are still ordering this test. So we're telling people not to order it. You're not gonna get a good read here. It's probably gonna be negative because it's too soon to see a result. But of course, the longer you wait to order that serology test, the more likely it is to be positive. So you see that there. And obviously statistically significantly different. Now, it did not really make that much of a difference which serology, which company's test you use. We had three in our system. Uh, and just to be crystal clear here, right? This is all real world data, right? We didn't ask anyone to do anything. We already had the test results. So there was a liaison, there was a DZ, I think it's Dizyme, and then Beckman had theirs. And in the early days, you could see a slight difference here, but they all kind of peak out there. Maybe the DZ is less sensitive as time goes on. Uh, but uh, in general, the overall uh, sensitivity, uh, so the, actually Beckman was the best one. You see the dash line at the top there reaching over 80% sensitivity when you look uh, that far out. And the overall was about uh, 75%. So in other words, going all the way 100 days out, still only 75% of those patients, we found a positive serology, even though we knew they were positive by PCR. You can see a slight difference male to female. Uh, there, I mean, it's significant, statistically significant. Males were more likely to have that positive, females less. And then there is a difference in the age as well. So the uh, 55 to 59 and 40 to 49 were definitely the highest to show the risk response. And weirdly, the ends, the youngest and the oldest were the less, least likely to show an antibody response. And again, just make it crystal clear, everyone here was PCR positive. Uh, so we were just looking to see if we could find a positive serology test um, from existing data here. So the best sensitivity was 112 days out. Uh, and then we're still going. I mean, like we had a, a couple hundred here. I think we now have a couple thousand so we can put out another uh, set of stories here as, as we collect, uh, let's say another six months or so uh, of data. And then this one came out. This has nothing to do with me directly. It's indirectly. Here's another paper using UC Quartz. So you might've seen this in New York Times on Monday. This was literally there on Monday, uh, long COVID, right? Now, of course, we know NIH, uh, HHS is giving a lot of money to study long COVID, so everyone's getting the long COVID stories out now. And this is uh, out from UC Irvine, um, showing what they were able to show. Uh, I'm not going to steal their thunder, but they showed, uh, as you can see the headline, 32% of folks that were asymptomatic, at least we couldn't find any symptoms, had troubling, troubling after effects. In other words, long COVID symptoms uh, weeks or months later. And this whole thing, as you can see on the right, the preprint is on the right there in MedArchive, and you can see that they use UC cords to do this. So we are now success, successfully enabling hundreds of researchers across the University of California with this central database uh, with the uh, UC cords, uh, with the COVID data here. All right, so some punchlines here. I think I'm still doing okay for time. Uh, what did we learn? Okay, what did we learn? Uh, I might have skipped over one important fact is we're not using Epic to do any of this. So of course, Africa's electronic health record, but we take all that data out of Epic into OMOP format. Now OMOP is, goes way back to Sentinel and Columbia University, right? OMOP is so old, it's new again. We love OMOP because it's a vendor neutral format for us. And again, we were happy with monthly OMOP dumps from each of our campuses stitched together centrally. Now we had to switch to daily ones. But there's always this issue when you're converting and harmonizing data, how to boil the ocean, right? Because there's so many little details on each campus, which ones you pick first to harmonize. Of course, for years, we had been harmonizing all of our population health measures, right? Like diabetes and eye care and kidney health and all those, we were harmonizing all of those. Like here's a new diabetes medication. Let's make sure we're calling it the same thing. Because we were geared up to do all this for population health and accountable care and all of that. But with COVID, all of a sudden, we had to harmonize our ECMO settings and intensive care unit settings. And so it was a very different set of doctors we had to work with to get these harmonized. It's important because we weren't really working with ICU docs before. And so here on the right there, you see an example of just all the ECMO settings. I mean, this is a tiny snippet of a massive list 
uh, from uh, UCLA had already found all the SNOMED codes for their ECMO settings. They shared it with us centrally, and then we got everyone else to put their codes in the same spreadsheet, if you know what I mean. So we had to borrow from early successes like at UCLA and get those harmonized. Because otherwise, we didn't really have the uh, mean airway pressure harmonized across the UC Health. Now we do, because obviously COVID. So whenever people say, yeah, we're, we're using OMOP, it doesn't always mean they're, they're translating everything into OMOP right away, right? You're strategically choosing what to harmonize. We had chose population health and primary care. Now, obviously, we have COVID and intensive care also harmonized. Uh, but we had to get our EPIC programmers who knew all these details with the clinicians, with BRAID, which is our research umbrella across all of our CTSIs, CTSA programs. And that's how this happened really quickly to get this uh, up and running. So that's one thing we learned. Uh, obviously, we learned how to safely deliver this data to our researchers. What I keep telling you, see courts. Uh, and just to also be clear, our IRB director, so what's in this database? So we have all of our identifiable data, right? Cords is a subset that is de-identified, so HIPAA 18 identifiers, except we have the actual dates in there, okay? Now, it mimics what you'll see in N3C, which is the NCATS uh, database. In fact, we're using our work on cords to update, uh, to uh, upload into N3C, the, the NCATS repository. But CORDS has been blessed by all of our IRB directors as non-human subjects research. So we want this data to be safe, secure. You can't download it, can't give it to anyone else. You have to agree to all that. But to use it for questions, you actually don't need to get IRB approval for anyone in the University of California because it's already been pre-approved and it, we've, it, it's been deemed safe enough that it's non-human subjects research. And because of that, so then we put on uh, uh, workshops. That's how we got people to actually use this. Here's an example of a workshop that UC Irvine did. No wonder they're writing so many papers. There were 150 people at this workshop back in June learning how to do, use OMOP, how to do chords, how to use UC chords. And then we enable many of our faculty to get research uh, funded, including uh, the evidence uh, accelerated stuff we've been doing, more Cersei work on chords uh, and with COVID, Robert Wood Johnson Academy, Health, FDA, Moore Foundation, uh, M3C and others. So because we did this work, we got faculty funding uh, to get more work done. And then we learned the public really needs to see all this too. So we've been tweeting these numbers, uh, at least some set of these numbers uh, every single day since April. Uh, one of the first tweets you see on the left there. And you can see on the right there uh, that in general now our tweets reach 1.4 million impressions every quarter. The public needs to see data on COVID. Because if you don't have a family member or a friend affected by COVID, or if you're not in the healthcare worker space, COVID is invisible, right? There are not lines out the emergency room, you know, like how would people know this is a real disease or real disorder? So it's up to us to put that true data out there and what, what how COVID is really impacting us. Otherwise, you know, let's just say false news fills in the gap. So to us, we, we put this data out there every workday uh, and you can see an average impression, average tweet gets 100,000 people looking at it now. People really want to know where are, how is the UC Health System doing in terms of tracking and uh, taking care of all, all of our patients here. So I'm just going to end with some acknowledgments. The team that's been doing this, Rohit made these slides. So, uh, of course, he didn't put his name in this, but these are all Rohit Vaisha's slides. Uh, he was the first author on that serology paper, and I, he, I see many more papers coming from him. And he's been really a point of contact that the evidence accelerated calls. But uh, Cora, Lisa, Ian, uh, Charles, Aiden, Andrew, and many others doing the work. Uh, incredible team that puts the central database together, including leadership support from the CIOs, the CEOs. Uh, uh, Carrie Byington is our executive vice president of UC Health. So I report to her and her support, many others uh, at UC Health. Uh, and then, of course, support from all sorts of folks who've been helping me throughout my career including UC Sub, Priscilla Tran, Mark Zuckerberg, the Baker Foundation, many uh, NIH grants and now FDA as well. So let me just stop there. There's already been one other question uh, on text notes. We've been working like crazy to get to text notes. Um, I think um, we, so we have right now, uh, in terms of text notes, uh, pathology and radiology, uh, but we've been playing with and really uh, trying to uh, do the cutting edge on text notes at UCSF. So the way I kind of do things is, I get my UCSF team to really innovate like crazy. And then we kind of smear it across UC Health. At UCSF, 
Uh, we have all 105 million notes de-identified. We've had a paper called Filter that was published last year on how we're doing this. Uh, it's up in front of a trusted third party con company now to bless them as being de-identified. I'm pretty sure they're de-identified de de now. So I think we're gonna get there. And then once that's been certified, then we're gonna use the same algorithm to de-identify all notes, not just COVID, all notes across the entire University of California. Our best guess is that we have half a billion notes uh, across the entire University of California. So we'll get there. I think we're gonna get there. We're also doing concept identification. That's another whole story, separate story. Uh, so let me uh, uh, see if there's other questions. Yes, um, let me, first of all, let me thank you, Atul. What a fabulous presentation. And I wanna remind people you can stick questions in the Q&A box for Atul to address. And I have a couple, Atul. So Go you, for noted, it. <laughs> you noted that Asians had a higher mor mortality rate from COVID. Um, and I wondered if you had noted why using your data, for example, were they from one healthcare system or were they treated differently, et cetera? Yeah, it's a great question. So we're looking into that. And so um, uh, Kirsten Bivens Domingo is one example of someone who's been looking at that like at UCSF. Uh, it's occupational, right? It's also uh, socioeconomic status is uh, captured in some of our cities being Asian or not. So I think we're gonna see a lot of that. Um, my, my intuition is that uh, essential workers, especially in San Francisco, um, there's a little bit of a, a predilection on the Asian side there, probably also at UCLA as well. So I think it's, it, it's a marker for that. Okay, Can, I have another question, Atul, sorry, but some of the sure. antivirals, remember, I don't know, hydroxychloroquine and chloroquine, and remember when all the news came out, could you follow like they were being used and did you see the drop and are they still being used? Yeah, so uh, they're not being used. Uh, we we showed the drop. Um, if people are really curious, if no one asks questions, I'm going to see if I can find that old slide. Uh, because I think we showed that at one of the evidence accelerator meetings. Uh, okay. So it's a great question. I will I will search for that as we are collecting more questions here. Okay. And I also have more and there's one up there now. Yeah, I think we have plenty of time here for questions, right? Uh, yeah. Uh, let's see here. Okay. If there was another pandemic in the future, you think this system could be quickly adapted and modified to collecting new data. Uh, so remember, nothing beats health system data because we're going to do this no matter what. Without a grant, we got to collect this data, right? And I'll also say, people call this messy data all the time, right? I don't think this is messy data. It's beautiful data. It's a messy world, okay? <laughs> it's just accurately captured in the EHR. Some people call it messy. Right? The world is messy, okay, when we take care of patients. It's super messy. So I think that, of course, this data has got to be used, pandemic or not, okay, real world evidence. You guys have all sorts of programs there. We, we know all about them, right? So, of course, this data is there. It's got to be used. Could it be used to collect new data? Uh, I think it's, it's challenging to exactly answer that question. So, for example, if you ask me, right, where in SNOMED and in OMOP do we actually record whether a patient is prone or not? right? Which direction are they facing, right? I guess that's a big thing for taking care of COVID patients. But for life of me, I'm not sure exactly where is it coded in stomach. So then we all of a sudden have to harmonize something new like proning, right? So I think it's not auto magic, right? You have to see where's care going and adapt the scripts and the programs right away, right? They're talking about proning. Okay, we got to start coding for proning, right? Back and forth, right? So the point is to be super agile about it. And just don't, don't be just the data collectors without talking to the docs to see what they're doing next here, right? Uh, another question is uh, susceptibility to COVID uh, because of the medications they're taking. Oh my gosh, we've done many of these. In fact, I think we've published a couple of these too. Now, let me be clear about that first question there that's in the Q&A. It's super easy to find protective drugs for COVID, okay? Let me tell you why. Imagine that you had a drug that's for a rare disease. I don't know, spinal muscular atrophy, let's say, okay? And just, there's so few SMA patients in the University of California, and by chance, none of them, let's say, have gotten admitted for COVID, right? Boom, Here's a, that's a drug that looks like it's perfectly protective for COVID, right? So it's super easy to get the statistics to work but you've got to take into account how much is that drug already used anyway, right? Because it could be that a very sensitive population is staying the heck away from others with COVID right now. And
and thus it looks like it's a protective drug. So there are many confounders in looking and answering that top question there, okay? I could spend an hour on just that. Uh, and I encourage you to be careful too, look at real world evidence for COVID protection because it's just very easy to find drugs that are so rarely used that just by chance, the patients on it never got admitted so far. Oh my God, there's so many questions coming. Dan <laughs> Rosen, all right, NIAID. Can you tell us about the uh, anaphylaxis? So Dan and I have chatted about this. We're still trying to capture vaccine related. Okay, so vaccines, let's talk about vaccines. What a mess, <laughs> what an absolute mess. So all of our effort on vaccines is trying to even just make sure they get to the arms. And my goodness, the biggest challenge we have are two doses. I am so glad that Janssen and I think now Merck will be making those single dose vaccines, but just having two doses is a world of pain for us looking at the information technology side of it. And just to make it crystal clear, it is still not clear to anyone in the whole situation who holds the second dose, right? And to just be really kind of point blank about it, I could take, let's say a million doses in the freezer and give them all out tomorrow. But then in three to four weeks, I got to figure out who is going to give us the million extra doses three to four weeks from now. Like, are we guaranteed to get them? Should we be saving them in our freezer? No, we've been told not to save them in our freezer. We should give everything out. And there's a lot of negative feedback loops happening right now, which is leading to constant COVID vaccine mess. Now, Dan has asked us to look into the anaphylaxis. To be honest with you, Dan, I have not looked at it since our call, I think three weeks ago, uh, but uh, we're, we're looking for vaccine-related anaphylaxis. It's the ICD-10 code. My bet is not a lot of people use that code, so we'll look for anaphylaxis in general, but we'll definitely be looking for that and other adverse events. I think there's a CERCI call out now for vaccines. We've been working with Steber on flu vaccine adverse events. I think that's the pilot for us to get into COVID vaccine. So I'm sure we're gonna be there working with FDA on that. Well, more questions. Data harmonization and OMOP. Uh, yes, we are harmonizing data on an operational level. Can I tell you what a killer advantage that is, right? We have a single database for operations, which means health system, strategy, quality reporting, and research the same database, right? So in other words, once one of those groups pays for it, the other group already has it. That's why we have this, right? So it's generated enough value for us system-wide that it's already built. And then we can de-identify from there. So the same data warehouse is used for operations and for uh, research. It's in our own financial interest, for example, to know about CAR T cells, right? We want to see more of these patients. We want to understand, is it working, not working? So all of that harmonization is already done. And now we can do research on it, right? Does that make sense? It's a killer advantage. I'm going to go even further and say, I challenge any of you to find five or six academic medical centers in the United States that bulk data share like we do at this high frequency, okay? I challenge you to find that because, th because we're so far apart that we don't compete with each other. And, but we all have a strategic interest to work with each other. That's why it happens this way. Uh, that's OMOP. Okay, so Karen asks, micro tears in blood vessels, blood vessel damage. Good question. How are we looking for this? Brain that's actually a great question. I actually don't know clinical care on this one. Obviously, I showed you the blood thinner aspect of it. I don't know if patients are getting CT scans, PET scans, looking for microvascular micro tears or microvascular damage. There might be others who might be able to answer it uh, here, uh, but I actually don't know. If you know, uh, if you're at the FDA, if you know that people are using test XYZ or if they're looking at radiology and want to study it, let us know. We're, we're ready to go, okay? But, uh, but if you tell us it's PET scans, I'll, I'll go find the PET scans. We can find those uh, pretty easily here. Uh, let's see if there's more, are there more questions coming? Uh, let's see. Uh, no questions. None so far. All right, hold on one second. Don't all leave me here yet. Let me show you my best winner so far. Hold on one second. All right, I'm gonna show you the uh, highlight reel here. All right, these are my, okay, let me stop sharing this and start sharing this. Uh, all right, you're gonna love this. PCR testing. These are my greatest hits. I'm gonna show you three patients, okay? These are real patients. This is kind of interesting. Okay, here's a patient. 
I don't know why we keep testing this one. Maybe it's zero surveillance. Uh, on the bottom, the X, so, okay, so what are you gonna look at? Three patients, all the negative results are at the bottom. They're just artificially scattered just so there are no overlapping points. So this is a patient that started negative, went to positive, went back down to negative for one test, went back up to positive for one test, and now has been negative for 200 days. So I'm gonna guess this patient was positive, although there's a kind of interesting negative in the middle of the positives there. I don't even know why we keep testing this patient. For sure, they must have had COVID. I don't know if they're gonna turn positive again, but we'll see. All right, here's another one. This is more interesting. So you see, again, 150 days on the x-axis here. Look how long this patient stayed positive. Went from negative, went to positive, whole bunch of negatives in the middle there, okay? And now, 100 and whatever, 70 days later, it's negative again, right? Uh, what is the gradation on the y-axis? There is no gradation. I'm just artificially scattering the negatives and the positives just to, so they don't overlap. In other words, it's not a CT number. I know you wish it's a CT number. I wish it was a CT number. We don't have CT numbers, I wish. I'm just scattering them so they don't overlap. So you can see how many tests we're doing on, on these patients, okay? So a lot of positives, but a lot of negatives in the middle there, kind of curious. Here's a weird one, okay? So here's a negative, went to positive for about 25 days, went back down to negative for a bunch of tests, went back up to positive, went back down to negative 100 days later, and now it's positive again, okay? So I guess I could ask you, how many episodes of COVID did this patient have? One, two, three? I'm not really even sure, okay? Do you count the one kind of weird one in the middle there as a second episode of COVID? It's more than 30 days since the first batch. I have so many of these guys, okay? <laughs> this is real world data on COVID PCR testing, okay? I, I just picked these three because they're like weird. I got hundreds of weird ones like this. If you're really curious, let's Cersei the heck out of this one. These are the tests that are EUA, okay? In real world settings here. All right, that's generating more questions. You collect data for contract tracing. Alas, we don't. With our, we train contract tracers, we have all that, but we don't have any of that in the EHR. Now, I, I'm guessing maybe some docs report, you know, says they were exposed to someone in the notes. We're not really doing anything with that yet, uh, sadly. Virtual telephone interactions, are transcripts available? Transcripts are not available, but the documented notes are. Uh, now, actually the transcripts are interesting. I don't think we're recording any of these telemedicine encounters. Uh, but we're definitely documenting it, right? We want to get billed for them. So there is documentation there. Uh, to be honest with you, I haven't even looked at the documentation. But for example, one of the questions we're asking is how many telehealth encounters led to a medication being prescribed, right? And was it one that they were on before? Was it a new drug? I'm super curious, what do we actually do in a telehealth encounter? Or is it just giving advice and whatever? Like, are we ordering blood tests? I'm really curious about that. So we got a grad student work on that. Uh, variants are likely to be incubated in patients. No doubt about it. We got to get better at variants. We got to catch our variants in the EHR. I don't think anyone's doing that yet. But again, uh, do we, uh, this is showing off my naivete here. Are there EU wave sequencing tests yet? I, I know we're using them for research and epidemiology. Are they EU wave? Are they CLIA, CAP? I'm not sure we have one yet in, in the University of California, but maybe I'm behind. Uh, but yeah, we got to get to better uh, variant uh, testing. Uh, that answers the top two there. Uh, do the negatives intersperse with positives? Sampling site, sites that ensure proper sampling. I'm not sure how to answer Ronald's question there or what it means. Uh, remember, so these are our medical folks doing the testing here. You know, so, you know, like essentially brain biopsying. I'm kidding. You know, so these aren't self administered like the drive up tests. But beyond that, I'm not really sure how to answer that one. Um, and then real world data is messy. Nah, the data is beautiful. The world is messy. The real world is messy, yes. Uh, but we need a clear idea of what long COVID is. No doubt about it. We see the calls for proposals. You know the University of California is gonna write a whole bunch of proposals. We're trying to enable as many faculty as we can with all this COVID data. And I think we're gonna just get better at capturing this. We'll have the ICD-10 codes, but of course we'll have the notes. We'll extract out symptoms from all of that uh, and go from there. I think that's it for the question so far, Kathy, unless you have more. <laughs> we still have time, I think. I'm still going here. I do have more a tool, but I wonder if we shouldn't end. I do. I want to know about all these people on concomitant medications and safety signals. Are you getting safety signals for drugs? Great question. 
Yeah, so I think, you, as you know, Kathy, we have grad students working on how to extract safety signals from the EHR data. I think we can get there. Now, it's all about sensitivity specificity, or let's say precision recall, right? If there is a signal in the EHR, I think we can get it. If they had something at home and didn't tell us, not sure we're going to get it, right? So there's going to be some element of missing this there. Right. But at the same time, there's certain safety signals that are way easier to get, right? When a sodium level drops or potassium goes up, obviously we could see the numerics there. But if it's a vague symptom like headache or diarrhea, how often do we capture the structured coding? You know it's in the notes if it's anywhere. So we got to get better at extracting those. So that's why we've been investing like crazy in trying to figure out the notes. Okay. Right? That's exactly why there. Okay, great. Thank you. Let's see other if there's questions. other questions there. And in the meantime, I'm looking up the remdesivir. No, the hydroxychloroquine, right? Uh, I don't think we ever you really and I used think Kinera, it. Did he answer your question? kanira has got a question there. Did you answer that right? I could the variation be related to mutated strains or variants? Anything could be due to mutated strains, no doubt about it. We just we're just not capturing that data at all right now, sadly. Okay. Let's see here. No other questions. Let me just search if I can find the hydroxychloroquine data. Uh, this is probably old, but uh, let's just see. Uh, yes, okay. This is really an old slide. We have not updated it since July, but yes, indeed, we were using hydroxychloroquine. Okay, uh, here. If anyone's still curious, uh, we stopped tracking this one in July. Uh, yes, in March and April, we were using it, 100 ish uh -huh. patients on this. Um, so this is an old slide. We, sh we showed this way back in the summer to the Evidence Accelerator Program. So yeah, it's in there if anyone wants to track it. Um, if anyone can, uh, any patients with lupus, undoubtedly, I'm pretty sure, I see dermatomyositis, I'm guessing it's lupus patients. I don't know if it, we had enough to really show a uh, pre-existing condition um, that was statistically significant. Um, I'll stop sharing this slide and go back to that one and just see if lupus was up there uh on any of those uh graphics i, I went through this one kind of quickly but uh let me see let me just share this one again and let me just see if i see lupus um i'm staring at it like you guys are boy you know this is harder to read than i thought it would be oh. uh no i don't see lupus on this at least look we we see everything in the university of california but lupus at least isn't uh, at least one of the higher ones that we would say with confidence is uh, pre-existing. Uh, so all I see is dermatomyositis. I don't see lupus. Uh, maybe one of you see it here. Uh, should assume an email, we can search for it then figure out you know, manually. It, just because it's not our chart doesn't mean we don't have it. Okay, Atul. Other questions for Atul? He's ready. You've got him for a few more minutes if you want him. <laughs> No, seriously, we love working with the FDA. I mean, look, this is, we really built this to, to be used by researchers, though it's all operational data, right? I mean, it's the beauty of this. So I, I still think it's a one of a kind system. Uh, we love the partnership with FDA, uh, Cersei and beyond, uh, and really hope that continues beyond COVID. I mean, I think uh, you wanna know how many biosimilars we're using, right? We have all the biosimilar data in here too. We have everything in here, right? This is everything we need to practice medicine. Um, so it's way beyond claims data, right? It's way beyond claims data. Uh, we have all the cancer genomics data together, right? I think we have now, I think 12,000 cancer genomes in the same database. Uh, so you can look for a P53 mutation and see if that actually led to change in therapy. We're looking at that kind of thing. Uh, info on drug shortages. That's a good one because we know if we are using a drug we're not sure <laughs> we're ordering a drug and it's not used, but you know what? There might be a canceled order in there somewhere. Uh, actually, it's curious. We certainly know about denials. Like if, if someone orders, if a doctor orders a drug and it's denied by a pair, we got all the denials in here too. In fact, we have a copy of the letters. Uh, so, but drug shortage is interesting. Maybe we could see if a, do, if a order is canceled, uh, there might be cancellation code. That's a, shoot me an email. We can look into the shortages. Uh, rate of rehospitalization is a good one. You know how hard it is to answer that question. <laughs> we haven't actually looked. And remember, these are already sick patients that are getting admitted. So we would really have to see that rehospitalization is more than expected, right? 
you know, the punchline for any of these COVID real world data studies, everything's in the control groups, right? Of course, we know what the cases are. What are the right controls to test against? So I love that question at the top there. And shoot me an email. We'd need to think through that one because the controls are really tough. How do we get in touch? Oh my goodness. Huh. Back to my first email. I'm very, I'm not hiding on the internet, trust me. Uh, but here is my email address and my Twitter handle. If you like some of this, uh, let's just see here. I'll just go back to the title slide here. Um, yeah, uh, so uh, that's how to reach me at the bottom there. Um, 185 unique treatment regimens. Uh, shoot, uh, shoot me an email about that and I'll put you in touch with Rohit who's generated that graphic. Uh, these are all treatments in the first 72 hours, but we can also do a, across longer term longer term stays. Uh, misinformation, disinformation, about using all the data, great question. You know, look, at a certain point, there's gonna be rogue analysts out there, okay? And rogue uh, interpretations. But I think the real, the real answer is that the more people, so we gotta really promote our own studies and findings that are resilient to rogue analysts, okay? Because the world is coming, a lot of this data is gonna to have to be open, okay? And I don't just mean COVID data, I mean all the clinical trials data, that's another whole hour long talk. So if we're entering a world where raw clinical trials data is out there, then it's gotta be really, you know, bulletproof findings that are robust enough to withstand rogue analysts. And that means even putting the R code and SAS code out there publicly available, Jupyter notebooks. I mean, we've gotta be more transparent as we're entering this new world about what exactly we did to get a p-value that the FDA then says is an improved drug. I think that's the new world that we're heading towards. But you know, I've been on many, many calls with the National Academies about clinical trials data becoming public. I think we're heading there. Um, long way to go to really answer that last question there. Wow. Okay, Atul. I think you really, we lasted, wow, you lasted with a lot of people here. Thank you so much for this fabulous presentation. Thank all of the FDA for attending. Hope to see you soon. Bye. Thank you. Thank you all. Bye. Thank you, Atul.